Hello and welcome to the Paul Green Comedy Podcast. This is October 3rd, 2024. This is episode 283. Stand-up comedian, actor, improviser, and dreamer. Paul Green coming to you. Sharing my journey. And my thoughts and insights as I pursue a pretty significant dream. In sharing those insights with anybody who might have a dream of their own. Or somebody who just finds it amusing to watch me bang my head against a wall day after day trying to make a dream happen. I am here for your entertainment. So, this week has been pretty low-key following what has been a couple intense uh, week. matter uh, weeks. matter of fact, September was just a pretty intense month. I had so much travel going on. I spent a week in L.A. at the Magic Castle. I then spent a weekend in Iowa. I then spent a weekend in Las Vegas with a stop off in Yuma. So it has been a wild, it's been a wild ride. I'll tell you what, it's it's weird. I do not know why I just thought of old school Johnny Carson there. So yeah, this week has just been me regrouping after a very grueling, competitive weekend at the World Series of Comedy up in Las Vegas, where I made it to the final six, but unfortunately did not advance to the final three, and I so badly wanted to go to that final three, but it was not meant to be. So, last night, I started writing again. I haven't really been writing that much over the last couple of weeks just because I've been traveling so much and I was in a position to where I needed to get ready for the World Series of Comedy. So, all of my energy was going towards really refining the material I already have and getting it ready for ready for competition. So I wasn't really coming up with or trying to come up with new material. And so, yeah, last night went and got me some food late and pulled out the old notebook and started writing and started trying to come up with some new material, and ultimately my sights are on the World Series of Comedy next year, 2025, baby, and I want to see if I can take my comedy to the next level and get to a point to where I can make it to that top three, you know what I mean? So that's That's the long-term goal. So we'll see how that goes. But to me, it's it's a lot more than just, oh, I got to write more, I got to write more. To me, it's... I've really got to see how I can get my comedy to whatever that next level is. I was talking to a friend about this last night, and I just said, I talked about how the the guy who won the whole competition, a guy named Cody Woods, I saw his, um, when I first saw him perform, I just went, oh yeah, he's the guy. He's taking this whole thing. And it was just undeniable to me. And that is something that I've always thought about, which is, the old Steve Martin quote, just become so good that they can't deny you. And, you know, in Vegas, I was pretty good. But I wasn't undeniable, undeniable because I got denied. And there's many ways to process that. I think what is far, an easy way to process that is to blame oh 
this is all subjective. Oh, this is bull crap. Oh, the judges were biased based off of this reason or that reason, or, you know, it wasn't fair, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And believe me, there's been plenty of times in my life when I have gone that route. I have done so many comedy festivals and comedy competitions that just didn't quite go as well for me. And instead of me just saying, okay, what did I learn? How can I improve? Maybe I got a little bitter or, you know, wanted to blame anyone and everyone else other than myself. So, yes, comedy is subjective. And yes, not every, you know, comedian is going to be everybody's cup of tea. But there is such a thing as being undeniable. And like I said, when I saw that that comic perform, I just went, yeah, I think he's going to take it. And he did. And so there you go. That to me is just something to look at and to study and to say, all right, my comedy sets, they were really good. They were really strong. They got me to the top six. But what is missing? What is the... What is the... I don't know if it's necessarily a missing element or not, but it's just how can I craft the next set of comedy to be all the more funny. And um, that's the challenge. That's the opportunity. Instead of being bitter about it, instead of moping, groping, blaming everybody else, just go, cool, I got to this level. What can I do to get to the next level? And I have some ideas. Um. One of the ideas that I'll share is this concept that I've I've thought a lot about, which is the idea of art versus fame and popularity. And I think about this a lot because over the years, as I have been involved in artistic creative pursuits to one degree or another almost my entire life. I mean, ever since a kid, I was involved in music and band and playing drums and piano and guitar and singing and playing in bands. And then I got involved in drama in high school. And then even in college, I was playing in jazz bands I did a lot more music early on in my life and wasn't really doing anything comedically or acting except for a few things here or there. And it wasn't until later in my life that I started doing comedy and less music. But throughout all of my artistic, creative pursuits, there seems to be this... I don't know if it's a debate. I don't really know how to describe it, but there just seems to be this philosophical... uh, Gosh. I'm struggling how to articulate this. I, I have heard so many artistic people vent and express frustration with this idea of... or or or... They're frustrated with certain artists that become tremendously popular versus other artists who do not become extremely popular, right? Well, why did that guy become famous or that woman become famous? And then there's this whole line of artists behind them who nobody's ever heard of, right? And this can be artists in any pursuit, you know, actors, let's just... For simplicity's sake, let's just talk actors, singers, and comedians. Right? It's like, why is Taylor Swift a billionaire when there's another 100,000 singer-songwriters who nobody's ever heard of who are, 
you know, playing for tips and coffee shops across the world and, you know, are not even close to even being able to make a, make a living as a singer because it's like really hard. And yet Taylor Swift is a billionaire, right? And you can look at that with comedians. Why is Jerry Seinfeld a billionaire as a stand-up comedian? And then obviously he became an actor and a producer, but he started as a stand-up comedian or Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart is worth millions of dollars. You can go to the acting route. Like why is Tom Cruise worth hundreds of millions of dollars? Right. And it can be very frustrating for so many artists who are living hand to mouth. And as part of that frustration, there's almost this um, resentment or there's this criticism that these artists who do become insanely popular, that they are somehow selling out. They are somehow um, not really true artists, right? It's like people will point to some other factor as to why they are so famous, which, by the way, is probably true in a lot of cases. It's like, yes, Taylor Swift is a singer-songwriter, but she also is incredibly beautiful and attractive and that definitely helps somebody become a pop star. Sure, Tom Cruise is a good actor, but, you know, he was also traditionally handsome and leading male handsome ever since, you know, he was a kid. So I don't want to suggest that there is not a element of superficiality to some degree that plays a role in somebody becoming famous over somebody else. However, along with this sort of cynical viewpoint that I that I've just come up against and I've and, and that I've thought myself, um, is this idea that because their art is universally appealing, that it's not true art. And it's not true art because it's popular. And that has always that has always baffled me a little bit. Because the insinuation is the only way to be truly artistic is to be so niche and to be so unpopular that that like know that you aren't popular or you aren't famous. Now, I'm not saying every artist thinks or feel that. I'm, I'm not saying that that is... that every actor, comedian, singer, songwriter feels that way. But I do... Again, I, I do encounter that sort of philosophical cynicism a lot. Especially in Los Angeles. Like, in Los Angeles, I, I, I cannot tell you how many actors and actresses and models and comedians I met. And it's so interesting to me because so many of them seem to have this disdain for capitalism and this disdain for, you know, corporate uh, greed and this disdain for for wealthy people, really, like like almost a hatred for billionaires and multimillionaires. Um, and they feel that, and again, I'm, I know I'm totally overgeneralizing here. I'm, I'm sort of accumulating, I'm kind of creating an archetype of this sort of artistic person, which again, I, I've just had so many conversations and heard so much cynicism and discouragement from so many artists and performers over the years that that's that's sort of the 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 collective um archetype of all of these artists that I'm drawing upon and it's like artists who actually of their own right have pretty big ambitions like all of them want to be rich and famous that's why they're in LA right they're in LA to pursue a dream to pursue acting in the hopes that they will get a big break 
and that they themselves will be rich and famous, yet at the same time, they seem to have a very healthy disdain for rich, for rich, famous people and have a, have a tendency to be very cynical and critical of those artists who did get big breaks and who did become incredibly famous and they don't feel that the people who get famous or get wealthy really deserved it or that they're really true artists or that they are um you know or that they were just sellouts or that the only reason that they're famous is for some sort of um lucky reason you know they're again they're really attractive or you know what like whatever it is and again i'm not saying there isn't some truth to that however I see any incredibly famous artist, let's go with T-Swift, how could you not? I go, well, yes, okay. She has some intangibles. She had some lucky breaks. She's tall, she's slender, she's beautiful. Sure. However, her music is also universally appealing to hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, to the point to where you know, I can hear her sing a song about being the nerdy teenage girl who can't get the attention of the boy because he's dating the cheerleader, even though she's not the good fit for him. And I totally get that song. And I, I, I have sung along to that song as a 40-year-old man. You know, going, yeah, can't you see you belong with me? Like, that song even resonates with me although I have never been a teenage girl. Um, and to me, I go, well, what's more artistic than being able to stir the emotions of the most amount of people? And... I guess not all art needs to be universal. I, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that. But to criticize one artist because maybe their music is more primal and maybe has an element of superficiality to it and isn't some like niche, nuanced, um, artistic experience that only a few people can really relate to. Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know if that makes makes it less artistic because it is popular. Any more than, you know, the 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 singer-songer singer-songwriter who's singing very like nuanced, deep, intellectual uh intellectually nuanced songs in the coffee shop for tips. I'm not saying that's not art either, but I don't think there's anything wrong with creating art that has mass appeal and that hits on a more universal level to the point to where millions of people can relate to it as opposed to maybe a small subset or or niche group of people. And by the way, if niche is what you want to go for, then then by all means, I'm not I'm not being critical of any artist's art or any creative person who's putting creative art out into the world what I am perhaps being I don't want to say I'm being critical of it I'm just being aware of this cynicism I'm just being aware of the cynicism towards artists who choose to express art in a more universally um, acceptable manner, if that makes sense. And what does this have to do with me and what I discovered over the weekend? So when I was watching that comedian who took first place, one thing that I observed is that the subject matter of his comedy was incredibly universal. You know, he was talking about Spirit Airlines and being on planes. She's talking about 
homeless people in L.A. And although, you know, people wouldn't know homeless people in L.A., everybody knows homeless people everywhere. And and he was able to talk about those topics and just have incredibly funny um, takes on them in terms of how he expressed about that express those topics and trust me I have heard hundreds of comedians talk about Spirit Airlines I've heard hundreds of comedians talk about homeless people just like we've all heard hundreds of comedians talk about marriage divorce kids careers politics right like all of those topics are very universal just like we've also heard every singer songwriter ever talk about love heartbreak you know sex uh, you know violence like these very primal universal things that everybody can relate to, to where, you know, when Taylor Swift talks about being in high school and not being the primary choice of the, you know, the other boy or girl at school that you have a crush on, the unrequited love, we all get it. We all get it instantly. Very universal, you know. Um... And that is what I am starting to look at now in my comedy. It's like, is is my comedy maybe a little too niche, a little too, you know, I'm trying to be a little too intellectual. I'm trying to be a little too above the audience in a way. It's like I had this whole bit about Shakespeare. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just like, you know, it, it was... And it was decently funny. People got it. I, I was able to make it relatable, but you know, it's Shakespeare. What it what a niche um thing to talk about. Or, you know, I, I do this whole bit about people who play the bassoon. Most people don't even know what the bassoon is. So that's been what I'm starting to look at is Am I trying to be a little too artsy with my art? A little too, well, maybe nobody knows what I'm talking about, but I'm an artist, and I don't need um, to sell out and just talk about all of these basic dumb things that only, like, the dumb general populace likes. It's just like, or, can I just say, you want to know what? I'm a human, too, and I have all of these same primal needs and thoughts and opinions, and how can I be more relatable? How can I talk about what most human beings have experienced in their life instead of being all artsy? Yeah. Anyway, so that is what I'm going to be focusing on moving forward as I start preparing for next year's World Series of Comedy and trying to figure out what sort of topics and uh, material I can generate between now and then. So that's what I will be focusing on. So, all right, I ranted a little bit longer than I thought I was on that. So... Those of you who follow the podcast know that I'd like to end the podcast talking about a book that's inspiring me to follow my dreams and helping encourage me. And I just finished The Magic of Thinking Big. And overall, I'm just going to wrap up because this podcast getting a little long and I got to bounce for today, but... Overall, really love the book, The Magic of Thinking Big, and all of the elements of looking at your mindset, looking at my mindset, and how can I challenge the way that I'm processing the world, processing my thoughts, my emotions, my feelings, and always looking for opportunities to expand my mind to the point to where my mind is working for me and not against me and that I'm looking for all of the opportunities out there instead of looking for all of the ways that things can go bad, looking for ways that 
things can be successful instead of how they can be failure. Looking for my, um, looking and analyzing my successes and how I can be more successful instead of allowing myself to get weighed down and discouraged by my failures. And it, uh, man, the more that I pursue this dream, the more that I go for it, the more that I am cognizant of how significant my mindset is in so many decisions that I make throughout the day and that it behooves me and I think it behooves all of us to start by looking at our mindsets. If our life isn't the way we want it to be, look at the mindset. If you're experiencing heartbreaking discouragements and things aren't going the way that you had hoped, look at the mindset. If you want to expand beyond where you are, you want to grow, you want to have better experiences, more expansive experiences, more fulfilling experiences, look at your mindset. And start from start with your mindset and then go from there. Analyze. It's it's kind of trippy, but it's like you almost have to step outside of yourself and then look at what you are thinking and feeling in any given moment and then go, huh, I'm thinking and feeling this right now, but why am I thinking and feeling that? This thing happened and now I'm discouraged or this thing happened and I'm offended. It's like, oh, well, why am I offended? Why am I choosing offense? Even if somebody said something offensive, it's like, okay, so let's say somebody said something to you that's objectively offensive, right? Well, sure, they said this offensive thing, but then why am I choosing to be offended at it? Because them saying something offensive actually has nothing to do with me. That's what they chose to say. But I'm the one who's choosing to be offended. I'm the one who's cho choosing to feel a certain way or to feel angry. And then look at your actions. Oh, well, why did I take that action? Because the action was a choice. And... Man, it is uh it's not a it it's not a fun piece of pie to 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 swallow. At least it hasn't been for me. I've had to swallow a lot of humble pies when I really looked back at certain ways that I was behaving to where in essence I thought that I was a victim of my thoughts and feelings. But then when I really looked at it, I went like, "Oh, no, I actually wasn't a victim of my thoughts and feelings." I was making choices to think and feel a certain way. And it felt automatic. It felt involuntary. But it's actually not voluntary. It's so, so much of what I think and feel is based off of a program, a neurological programming that I have installed or has been installed in my brain. And... It's actually malleable. It's software. It can be deleted. I can update it. I can upload new programming. I can just choose to. And use that new programming to choose to think and feel differently and allow my thoughts and emotions to lead me to different behaviors. And at the end of the day, it's the actions that I take into the world that enact the laws of Newtonian physics Every action has an equal opposite reaction, and whatever actions I put out there as a result of what I'm thinking and feeling is going to ultimately create the world around me. As much as I have influence to adjust the the world around me, which the the more I dive into this, the the more I realize that my capacity to influence the world around me is is at least, at least significantly more than what I give myself credit for. Now, I'm not saying I can, can, you know, I can influence anything, that anything that I think and feel or want or desire will happen immediately or will happen at all. But I will say I, I have learned that my capacity to influence the world around me is, again, significantly greater than what I have maybe allowed myself to think or believe in the past. 
and it might even be more than that, but I'm still on this journey and I'm still figuring it out and trying to process and understand and comprehend what my life is about and what this world is all about and how I can move forward into this world having desires, dreams, fears, thoughts, passions, desires, weaknesses, strengths, and all of that and take everything that is me and everything that is true and real, move forward into that world and challenge myself to see how much of life I can I can build and create to be the way that I desire to be for myself. And it all starts with mindset for me and really looking at how am I thinking, what am I thinking, how am I feeling, and why am I feeling that, and then looking at my behavior as a result. And just the more that I can be honest with myself and clear with myself and deliberate with those thoughts, feelings, and actions, the more I start to see the world realign itself in uh, con consistent with those thoughts, feelings, and actions. Oh, wow. Got very uh, philosophical and cerebral there at the end. All right, everybody. I am going to let you off the hook for today. So that is the end of The Magic of Thinking Big. I already have my next book lined up, which is a book pretty much about the same topic, um, which is The Magic Mindset. And what had happened was, is I saw this TikTok ad pop up for, I think actually for the magic mindset. And so I went to Audible and I typed in like magic and then the magic of thinking big popped up. So I was like, so I think I bought that book when I actually meant to buy the other book. And so now I've just had both of them in my queue. In my queue. So I finished the magic of thinking big and now I'm going to start listening to the magic mindset. And I will be talking about that book uh, throughout the next, um, few episodes of the Paul Green Comedy Podcast. But for now, I'm going to sign off. I love you all so much. I hope your dreams are coming true. Keep at it, everybody. I believe in you. There's so many great things to accomplish, so many great experiences to have, so much fulfilling life to be lived. And, um, start with mindset, everybody. All right. I love you all so much. This is the Paul Green Comedy Podcast. October 3rd. By the way, happy birthday to my brother. I think it's today. I can never remember if it's the 3rd or the 4th of October. Happy birthday to my brother, Mark. And um, I want to talk about a man who's living his dreams, has a large, beautiful family, and is a force for good in his career as a therapist and incredible, incredible human being. So anyway, all right, everybody. I love you all so much. Thanks for listening to the Paul Green Comedy Podcast, October 3rd, 2024, episode 283. I love you all so much. I'll talk to you tomorrow.